morning, everyone. My name is Katja Giri. I am the host of Creative Mornings Munich, and I am super excited to be here today. I have stopped sharing the music, and I will soon share my screen so that we can go through a few slides together. But I just wanted to say a very warm welcome to everyone. As you know, we haven't been seeing a lot of each other lately. And, uh, you know, we don't have the in-person meetings anymore. Uh, and basically until recently, until this month, we were doing these meetings uh, virtually over uh, Facebook, Facebook Live. And you know what? We missed you. We missed seeing your faces. We missed interacting with you. We missed having some coffee with you, even though virtual. And we wanted to change this. We wanted to see your beautiful faces again. We wanted to make sure that, you know, we get together as a community again. And this is why we introduced uh, Zoom to our sessions. And we're super happy to see all of you here today this morning. So what I'm going to do, I'm still trying to get used to all the tech, is that I will share my screen uh, so that I can take you through a few of the uh, Zoom features that may be easier for you to understand in case you're not very uh, well acquired with the uh, Zoom yet. Uh, but basically what I wanted to say was that there are some great things about doing sessions virtually. First of all, you can wake up just five minutes before the session and be there on time. <laughs> you can come in your pajamas if you want to. No one is going to say anything. Uh, or you can just virtually uh, have a look at everyone's places, everyone's faces. Uh, so that may also be quite interesting uh, for, for this virtual environment. What I will kindly invite you to do is to participate. We really want to encourage participation here. And um, what we want to encourage, first of all, is that everyone puts themselves on mute when someone else is speaking. And if you want to share anything, or in the Q&A session that we will have at the very end, we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question on your own. So we want to make sure that uh, this is not just, you know, uh, a boring, uh, straightforward talk. We want to interact with you, and you're going to be one of the most important parts when it comes to that. Don't be shy. I'm highly encouraging everyone to turn cameras on, to, to show your faces. We would be super happy to see everyone. Uh, and what I, I'm also encouraging you to do is to switch to the gallery view. <laughs> I'm, I'm already seeing Wolfgang, so this is great. Uh, and I will kindly uh, ask Nico to mute himself, I think he's on, he's on, on speaker. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, so, going back. what I'm going to do as well is that I'm going to quickly share a few words about Creative Mornings Munich, about Creative Mornings as such, for those who may be uh, here as the first ones. So, um, first of all, Creative Mornings is a community of people who gather together in over 200 chapters, 200 cities around the world, once a month for a creative talk and some inspiration for some virtual coffees as well. <laughs> uh, and then as well um, for, for a really inspiring get together as the community. We are today present in over 200 cities in over 60 country, countries and we have uh, many, many different talks around the world happening at the same time. Uh, and the whole concept and the whole idea started over 10 years ago back in New York, when Tina, the, the creator of Creative Morning, she had the idea of people gathering together once a month around some virtual, uh, sorry, not virtual at that time, around some, some gathering, some coffee and an inspiring talk. And then a lot of chapters just 
uh, said, oh, we want to bring this to our city as well. Let's do it. Uh, and this is how we grew to over 60 countries presence today. There is, oops, there are also some magicians in behind uh, behind the seasons here. This is the team of Creative Mornings Munich. Uh, to whom I really want to um, say big thanks for making magic happen every month, for uh, being here and adapting to the virtual reality, uh, being here in the chat, welcoming you and uh, making sure that everything goes smoothly. Um, on this stage as well, I would just like to say, so as I invited you guys to um, show your faces to, to put the cameras on. Uh, I also want to make sure that you know that we are um, we are recording this session so that we can replay it afterwards for those who may not be able to uh, to join us today. So if you want, you may also um, uh, pick up a virtual background if you have any secret uh, things happening in the background. Uh, but we would be super, super happy to just see your faces. And I'm highly encouraging you to switch the view to the gallery view on the top right corner where you see all different faces you can actually see everyone at the same time and it is just really beautiful to see uh, the community that we have here in munich now oops the topic of the month is transit if you are uh, if you are subscribed to our newsletters you're well aware and well acquainted with this visual uh, illustrated by alea ray um, what we are going to do, though, before just a little bit before giving the stage to 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 Wolfgang, our speaker today, uh, is that I want to say a big thanks to our global and local sponsors, uh, without whom this event just wouldn't be possible. You may all know that Mailchimp is and has been one of the the loyal one of the most loyal sponsors of Creative Morning since the almost very beginning. Uh, and today I want to share something with you uh, regarding MailChimp. Uh, they made a collaboration between Vice and uh, it is called Essentials. And Essentials, they actually provide a glimpse into how small businesses around the US have found ways to adapt uh, while interacting with the uh, people during this uh, whole COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so we are going to, uh, to share a, a link in the chat uh, and you can watch uh, and see how restaurant or bike messengers or food banks are coping with those uh, cutbacks all while staying safe. It's really interesting, so I highly encourage everyone to, to have a look. Maria is going to share it in the, in the chat. Second uh, of the sponsor is Basecamp. And we want to say a huge thanks to Basecamp, of course, um, for our global uh, partner for project management. And today, today, um, I, I want to share um, that as well. Maria is going to share it in the in the chat. Uh, you can listen to a Basecamp's love letter to email in the episode of Rework, which is a podcast by Basecamp. Uh, it's a it's a really beautiful uh, podcast, so we would highly encourage you guys to to uh, scroll over and uh, have a look at, uh, after the session. I want to say a big, big, huge thank as well to our local sponsors, without whom truly we wouldn't have been able to to uh, manage our sessions. Spinning Wheel Production, uh, who is always taking care of us looking well on videos uh, and making sure that you guys can actually rewatch the videos afterwards. To Nico Riva, um, uh, taking photos behind the scenes, making sure that it, we can interact and bring the, the uh, experience on our uh, Facebook photos, Instagram photos, and so on. Uh, One Wave Studio is well taking care of the video uh, when spinning wheels is uh, too busy. Raphael Schilgen, who is coaching our speakers, who is taking the time to make sure that the presentations are top notch and uh, that you may enjoy them. And then uh, as well, Milana, for, uh, for sponsoring us with the Zoom link. So thank you so much, all the local, local sponsors. And now what I'm going to do is that um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen just as soon as my, just as soon as I can up find the button.
button to do that. Yes. Uh, and I am going to introduce uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang, you may already see him if you're on the gallery view. Wolfgang is going to uh, give us an incredible talk, super exciting talk on the topic of transit. And I myself am so excited about that. Um, Wolfgang is a really, really nice, genuinely nice guy um, uh, who has been going out and beyond to prepare this topic uh, for you guys. Uh, so I wouldn't want to say too much uh, without spoiling it, but I would like to say big thanks to Wolfgang for being here today with us. And without further ado, Wolfgang, you can unmute yourself and I'm going to mute myself and then the stage is yours take us into the world of transit. Cool. Thanks, Katya. Hey, folks. Um, my name is Wolfgang. Uh, it's great to be here today. And uh, by here, I mean my home uh, with, you know, my beautiful whale poster right here, uh, my favorite coffee bug. And my most trusted co-worker these days, uh, my dog. He's sitting over there snoring. So I hope, um, you know, if you if you hear strange background noises, it's not me. It's, it's the dog. Um, Cool. So it's a real pleasure to do this. Um, I'm seeing 32 participants, so that means we're a nice and intimate group of people. So um, that means you have to expect that I call you out individually at any moment in time. No, just kidding. Um, I guess I'll just share my screen and then we can kick this off. Boom. So if you guys see a blue good morning, can you just nod that I know it's working? Cool. All right. So good morning, everyone. Um, let me start by telling you guys um, two stories. And uh, one of them is true and one of them is false. And uh, we actually figured out that Zoom has a little polling feature. So after I told you the stories, think which one is true and then you can participate in the poll. And I, I wonder which, which one you go for. So um, story number one. Um, a young man starts playing a role-playing game about um, magical monsters and swords and heroes. Um, but slowly, he gets lost in the game. And um, he thinks that the monsters killed his younger brother. So he turns violent. He runs from the police until, uh, desperate for a miracle, he's about to throw himself off of a skyscraper. And then luckily, you know, he gets saved last minute. So that's story number one. And here comes story number two. And remember, only one of them is true. Um, so story number two, um, a young father starts reading articles online about uh, devil worshiping immortals. And slowly he gets lost in the story and he thinks that the demons um, want to kill his daughters. So he turns violent, he runs from the police until ultimately desperate for a miracle. He packs his family into a car, races down the highway, police chasing him, um, and luckily the story ends well. So those are my two stories. Uh, one of them is true, one of them is false. So let's see if we can fire up the poll and then I wanna see what you guys think, which one is the true story. So I just pulled the poll up. Let's take about 15 seconds so that we can vote. You can choose between story one or story two. Ooh, I'm following live. That's interesting. Yeah. See the results. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we end it? Good. Hang on. 19 out of 28. Come on, one more. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, I think I got to share results. Here we go. So story number two with 13 votes. Uh, or 13 people say story number two is true and six people say story number one is true yeah maybe you guys have read the news mm -hmm. so let's stop sharing right here and then move on in keynote let me see if i can do that yes so story number one is actually false so most people were right i'm still seeing the polling results so i think i have to close them yeah here we go so story number one is actually false. And you can see uh, this beautiful movie and book cover um, called Mazes and Monsters, which is obviously a Dungeons and Dragons ripoff. Um, it's a movie from the 80s. I mean, look at how young uh, Tom Hanks is in this picture. And uh, back then, you know, 
concerned parents thought that playing Dungeons and Dragons, which is a really nice game that I play myself, is sort of damaging your brain. Um, and that is false. But story number two, unfortunately, is true. So uh, that's an article I read this month um, in The Guardian about a man, you know, believing in a certain conspiracy theory and going nuts. So I guess what this shows is um, you guys read the news um, and you have a good sense for what is true and what isn't. But it also shows that truth is stranger than fiction, at least in my point of view. Um, also, we seem to attribute a lot of meaning to stories, uh, sometimes down to life and death situations. And um, last but not least, something has changed since uh, Tom Hanks looked like this. So um, I think stories are also changing our world. And that's actually the topic of uh, our talk today. It's about transit and how stories change their protagonist, our society, and your job. So transitions all over. All right. So um, I work as a design consultant here in Munich. I've uh, been doing that for a while. I'm also dabbling in writing um, fantasy and fiction myself. And I would like to share today four discoveries that I made over the last years that I think um, are really relevant for uh, a lot of creatives out there, maybe also for you. And um, I'm going to talk about stories first and why they are so important also to us. Then I'm going to talk about design and uh, why I think it's relevant for us designers. Then I'm going to talk about process and how you know we as designers might adapt to the new realities. And lastly, I talk about the dark side um, because you know there is no end to the possibilities. All right, so let's talk about stories and why do stories matter? So when you think about stories, um, you know we're almost in lockdown, so we watch a lot of Netflix these days. But for much of human history. Um, this is what you know nighttime entertainment looked like looking up at the biggest screen there is which is the sky and we humans are really really good at pattern recognition you know so we can't really just look at a, a bunch of dots uh, without connecting them so our ancestors recognized this pattern right here um, which is a nice little constellation and um, the ancient greeks for example you know they didn't stop there. They immediately saw this pattern and put a story on top of it. And they tell the story of um, an ancient Ethiopian queen called Cassiopeia, and this is her throne. Um, people in the Arctic Circle um, see th the horns or the antlers of a giant elk, you know, and I as a little kid uh, looking up at this guy with my dad, I just, you know, enjoyed the fact that this looks like my capital letter W. So we humans, we see patterns everywhere and we want to tell stories about them. And obviously, you know, um, the Ethiopian queen doesn't really exist up there. You know, obviously it's just a bunch of lighting dots. Um, and if you go further, you know, what does actually exist? Um, in his book, um, Homo Deus, Noah Harari talks about intersubjective reality. And he says, yeah, you know, all of these things aren't really real. Uh, we're just making them up and telling stories to each other um, to make them real. So the Ethiopian queen doesn't exist. Ethiopia doesn't really exist. You know, neither does Germany. If you drilled a hole in the ground here, you didn't find like you wouldn't find a German molecule. It's just countries are just stories we tell each other. And so are brands. And Harari goes on to mention, you know, law and human rights. We make the world work by telling each other stories. Um, now, that sounds pretty big, um, but if you think of storytelling today, um, and probably you, you're using this term a lot or you're hearing it a lot, um, you think of, I don't know, a particularly good sales presentation or maybe um, the common thread that connects this presentation. Maybe also you're doing some self-promotion and all of this is true, but I think uh, there's a lot more to storytelling and it's going to change our jobs as creatives a lot. And there's a couple of signals I'm seeing um, for why I think this is true. So first one is pretty obvious, I guess, uh, user stories. So this is my bread and butter as a designer. When you know the client has an idea about a function um, or a service or a product, we tell a nice little story you know, in written form, in image form to explain um, what this vision looks like. 
And I think you guys probably know this as well, so nothing new. Um, one thing that I've discovered maybe a year ago is um, UX writing. So I saw a good talk at the PUSH conference last year about how designers do more and more writing, and I can totally confirm that. So when you make a UI, you don't only you know put the colors and the buttons somewhere. Um, you also have to name the buttons, and you have to write the text that explains the user what they're supposed to do. So we have, or we are becoming writers already, uh, telling stories. Next one, voice UI. Um, we're all using Siri, Alexa, maybe some chatbots. Somebody has to write the text, you know, and Siri doesn't have a personality. Um, somebody scripted what she's saying, and that's all there is to it. So maybe we do that, you know, as designers. Um, but even more so, there are, uh, or there is this influencer out there called Little Michaela. Uh, she's very active on Instagram. She has a million followers. Uh, she, you know, has a very active lifestyle. She occasionally does product endorsements, and she is 100% not real. So um, somebody made that person, and uh, a lot of people know that she's not real, but they follow her all the same, Little Michaela. Um, somebody wrote that story, and a lot of people believe it. And lastly, um, the sheer size of the entertainment industry also makes me think that storytelling is playing a more important role very soon. Um, so according to one survey, we spend one sixth of our adult life watching TV. So we spend a lot of time inside stories. Also uh, in the United States alone, the entertainment industry generates more money than all of Belgium, a little less than Switzerland. So stories are given a lot of our attention, a lot of our time, and it generates a lot of money. So storytelling is changing, and I think the signals for that are abundant. So um, long story short, why do stories matter? Um, and it's been true in the ancient times all the way down to how stories shape our economy. I think they matter because stories define society. It sounds pretty big, but um, I think it's true. Next up, design. So why should we as designers care about all of this? And um, when you think of the word design, uh, in my professional life, it has changed meaning a lot. So when I started studying, design was regarded as you know beautification, um, graphic design, so on and so forth. But then design thinking happened. And now what I do in my day-to-day -day life is much closer to consulting. So I don't make things prettier for the clients. Um, I invent stuff together with them. And that impacts, you know, how they sell products, uh, how they position themselves. And that's a pretty big change. But what I think is that um, it's happening again. And the catalyst this time is storytelling. So what do you think is going to be the result of that transformation? Um, let me tell you or give you two examples from my uh, professional life that I think illustrate where I think the journey is going. And uh, I saw that some of the people who I work with on this are actually part of the call. So maybe you guys want to chip in later. So uh, example number one, um, I wouldn't be here without this guy. So this is a little uh, robot called Nomi. It lives inside an electric car for a Chinese e-vehicle manufacturer, Neo. And um, you can see it's um, pretty nice. It's uh, very you know, charming in the car sort of interacting with you and it can move around. So when we started working on this together with the client um, four years ago, oh my God, um, words like this popped up. So they had a very clear idea of what it was supposed to be. Um, it had to do with the smart car, the car HMI, so all of the other screens in the car. Uh, there was also gonna be a voice assistant and uh, it should be you know, high quality and helpful and friendly. And you're going to realize that these, um, you know, briefing words, they fall into two main categories, um, which is function and emotion. And, you know, as a designer, you cannot just um, leave the dots unconnected. So we had to connect them together. And we did that through storytelling, you know, and we tried to find the overlap between all of these words um, through stories 
And as I see it, you know, that overlap became Nomi. Because, um, for example, when Nomi helps you control the HMI, you know, Nomi looked down at it, kind of, you know, implying that it was actually looking. Or when you trigger the voice assistant, um, Nomi looks at you, sort of implying that it's all ears and listening to you. So the emotional part and the functional part were blended. And I think the reason why Nomi turned out to be so successful is um, the emotional and functional parts were blended and merged to a degree where you couldn't really tell anymore which one is which. There is just one Nomi, uh, which is a very, very complex service, but it feels very, very simple. So that was my example number one. And I'm curious to see uh, what the audience says later. Then example number two. Um, and again, this really happened, at, but for the sake of this presentation, let's say the client is an insurance provider and they came to us with a very complex briefing. And again, storytelling saved the day for us. So imagine the client comes to you um, with this as a briefing for a fantastical VR insurance app. So, you know, you open the app, you're kind of in this magical land of insurance. Uh, and there is a tree in there and it symbolizes your life and it grows with how safe you are and the tree prospers and thrives depending on you know your data. There is also an assistant in there helping you out, um, being very agile. And lastly, there is a wormhole that transports you to different places inside the service um, and you can go to other you know, services and do some shopping. And, um, you know, we worked with that briefing and it didn't really go anywhere because we didn't see how to connect those dots. And again, um, storytelling saved the day. So what we did first was do some mind mapping. You know, uh, a tree, for example, uh, like sunlight, it has roots, but it also makes and generates oxygen. Um, the wormhole thing, uh, sounds like time travel and astronauts, but um, if you've seen the Wizard of Oz movie, the little girl travels to a distant land uh, through a tornado. So maybe we could work with that. And then lastly, the assistant could be a butler or maybe a dog like mine, um, but it could also be you know, a little floating fairy with little fairy wings. And there is no connection yet, but if you rearrange the dots, um, a picture starts to emerge, you know, so oxygen, a tornado and the fairy, uh, they all have something in common, which is air. And this is all very, very abstract, but this really unlocked the project for us. You know, um, before the three parts of the briefing were completely disjoint. And now through some storytelling, they were part of the same story, which is air. Air has a certain sound, you know, so we knew what the sound design for that fantastical VR app was going to be like. It is also associated with certain colors. So maybe you have blue and white tones. Um, you can also illustrate, you know, how the wind is brushing through the trees. So there's so much you can do. And um, the complexity of the insurance app with all of its data is completely hidden inside, you know, this really living space. And by the way, this you know, I'm not making this up. Uh, this is a metaphor, uh, sorry, a method called forced connections. Um, and I think it's really, really helpful. And maybe next time you get a briefing that's a little weird, maybe you want to try it yourself. So um, where do I think the journey is going for us designers? Um, and what do I think do those two examples that I witnessed in my work life imply? So what's hidden behind the violet bar? We are going to be, ta-da, narrative designers. Couldn't think of a better word, but uh, let's talk about more about uh, what narrative means later. So um, why should designers care about stories? And I think we should care because stories make complexity relatable. The two examples you saw, you know, are high-tech AI stuff. Um, the world is getting more and more complex and so are the products we use. And if you as a designer can make it feel relatable and simple and immersive, you win. All right. So um, you might ask yourself, you know, what's the process? Uh, how do I get started in this? And uh, I've already shown you some examples. But uh, I asked myself the same question, you know, four years ago when I decided to uh, write a book myself. So I'm working on a 
kids fantasy book right now. Um, this is work in progress, you know, but what I would like to do with you right now is share some of the learnings I made uh, in that process. And I have five in total. So let's take a look at how, uh, at how I got started um, and how maybe you can do that as well. And I think in essence, uh, it amounts to a comparison of design and writing methods. And I'm assuming that most of you have creative jobs. So uh, like myself, design is what I knew. And now let's take a look at how those two compare. So again, um, when I started in design, this was pretty much the process, um, all intuitive, very messy, hopefully leading to a goal. When you Google design processes today, um, you get something like this, for example, that's um, one image of the double diamond methodology I found online. Um, I'm assuming you guys know that. It's um, a nice layout of how design works. So the same is actually true for writing. Um, so that's the first thing I found out. Traditionally, that's how writers work. So it's also very, very intuitive. And um, books like Game of Thrones, for example, got written like this. So even if it looks, mess it looks messy, it's very, very successful for some authors who have great experience, a lot of intuition, and just know how to tell stories. But um, what has happened over the last few decades, apparently, is um, design, as uh, sorry, writing also got a lot more methodological, methodical. Um, and for example, Harry Potter got written like this. Um, what you're seeing here is a framework called Save the Cat. So if you're interested in writing more, um, I would recommend you start here, Save the Cat. It's not what JK Rowling used, but um, I used it and I think it's really helpful. So that's the first observation I made. Um, both design and writing can be really intuitive and really method method methodical. Oh my God, can pronounce that word. Uh, really structured. Um, and I guess you get the best results with a little mix, but I also think uh, it's easier to start when you have some guidelines. So that was my first observation um, of how you can make the transition from a designer to a writer in terms of method. But there's more that I would like to share with you. Next up, uh, target. So as designers, we're really good at uh, talking about users. We use our empathy to create things for people we don't know. Let's say, you know, a single household in mainland China or something. I don't have a lot to do with that demographic, but I use research empathy um, to empathize or to uh, know what my target wants. And again, there is a pretty strong correlation with writing. So I'm writing my book for kids, so I have to think like kids. You know, I have a lot of kids in my family, so that's easy, but I have to respect them and empathize with them. Also, um, in writing, you have all of your protagonists, you know, so um, that fairy in my example earlier, or Nomi, they're your protagonists of the story, and they need to act in a credible way. And you can establish that by once more empathizing with them. So I think this really makes it much easier for us designers to do writing. Uh, next observation is about artifacts. So as designers, we create features, services, products, experiences. Let's say, you know, let's stay with our example of the single household in China. Let's say we make an air purifier. So that's really cool. It's a very specific briefing. And, um, you know, next step would be ideation. And it's a lot of fun. And again, the same is true for writing. So let's say um, you have, you need to ideate a weapon for a clan of magical ninjas uh, in outer space. You know, that's, that's a really cool design challenge. And one result could be the lightsaber. And for me personally, that's something I really enjoy about, you know, writing my fantasy books because of all the weird design briefings I can write for myself to come up with cool props. Um, next up, as designers, we work a lot with flows. So this is uh, an excerpt from a service blueprint. And, um, you know, what the user does is one part of the story, but behind the curtain, the staff is active, the backend is active, so on and so forth. And I am a nerd for mapping this out. And again, 
there's a strong similarity with writing. Um, I watched um, Christopher Nolan's new movie, Tenet, uh, last week. And it's the same there. You have the protagonist, the hero, and he's solving a mystery. And the villain, you know, behind the curtain, he pops up here and there. And it's an incredibly intricate story. And uh, I feel it's very, very designed. So again, another similarity. And lastly, models. Um, we love them as designers, you know, so Magic Quadrant, uh, Value Proposition Canvas, they're graphical, they're clear, they're clean, and then you can populate them. And that's also just very satisfying. And this is particularly true for writing fantasy, um, specifically for magic systems. So maybe you know these examples. Um, they're both taken from very, very successful fantasy stories. Uh, the top one's a book, the bottom one is a game. And again, you know, you want to fill up the framework as somebody who's engaging in this. And people like this so much that uh, the top one, for example, people have tattoos of those symbols. You know, it's super intense. So another similarity. And I just want to give you a quick sneak peek into the next section of my talk. Um, you don't only use that for fantasy, you can also use it for pseudoscience. So this is uh, the framework for the four elements and the zodiacs. And it's beautiful, but obviously that's not really what we designers want to do, right? We want to help people and not misguide them. But I'll talk more about that later. So um, to summarize those five observations that I made, um, how do I get started? How can you get started? And um, my experience is just hack your design skills. Um, it's a lot of fun to re apply what I'm doing in my work for something completely different and it works. And if you're interested in more details, check out Save the Cat. All right, so this was a section about process. And like I said, um, those frameworks for pseudoscience take it a little bit too far. So the last section of my talk is about the dark side and how far you can go uh, with this new set of methods. So um, let's just play a game here um, and just look at this image for a while. So this is a world map that somebody designed. Um, and if you can read the text in the middle, it says Jerusalem. So just take a look at this map real quick at this framework that somebody designed and just think about what story the designer is telling us here. So, Obviously, um, Jerusalem seems very important. The world is centered around it, at least the old world. And apparently, you know, the designer couldn't really connect the dot of America in this framework. So, you know, apparently the designer was struggling with that a lot. Um, so somebody put Jerusalem in the center of this map and I would interpret that as Jerusalem being very, very important to that person. Let's take a look at another map. Um, it's a little bit hard to read. And you can see that the center is uh, much more detailed than the rest. So let's assume that whoever made this lived there. But uh, it's a little unclear where they lived. It's a bit clearer if we flip it over. Ta-da. I think you're recognizing um, Europe and so on. So OK, so apparently the center is really important on maps. Um, and by the way, who gets to decide who's up and down on maps? Who sits on top of the world? Let's take a look uh, at the next map. So I'd say you know it looks uh, Chinese, judging by the characters. Um, and yeah, China is in the center. It sits in the northern hemisphere. So again, China is in the center, in the top of the world. So yeah. Pretty strong uh, statement here, I guess. Um, next world map. That's the world I grew up with. Um, probably it's true for you as well. So we can see Europe is in the center on top of the world. And it's about the same size as Africa. So it's really, really big, right? Um, but this map is inaccurate. Um, let's take a look at the last one. And it looks a little warped. But this is actually the continents in the right relationship in terms of size with each other. 
So this is how big the continents actually are. So just look at how big Africa is. And you can see that Europe is a third of its size, which is much, much more accurate. And again, um, who gets to decide that, um, you know, North is on top of maps, you know, the world floats in the middle of nowhere. It could just as well be the inverse. So look at this map and, um, you know, doesn't it change how we see the world? Look at how insignificant Europe is. So why am I telling you this? Why, why have we been looking at maps? Um, I think it's really important to note that narrative means two things. Uh, narrative means story, but it also means presenting facts in a way that supports your values. You know, like the example with my stars showed at the beginning, we all connect the dots differently and you can make sense of the same facts in very, very different ways using stories. And if you're the designer of these maps that we looked at, and if you print and make the maps, you're kind of owning the narrative. So you're presenting the world in a reality that suits you. And if there's nothing else from the talk um, that you guys take away from this, I'd like you to remember this one thing that will make you look at stories differently. Owning the narrative means power. So if you put your country or your world in the center of a framework, on the top of a framework, very hugely in the center at, to the top of a framework, um, that puts you in a powerful position. So, but what if you don't own the narrative? Then, you know, this can happen. So this is uh, what's going on in the Southern United States right now. Um, a long time ago, somebody put the statue there, you know, trying to own the narrative that this is a good, important, powerful person. And the world has changed. Uh, we don't agree with that anymore. So we really care about contributing to the narrative and shaping the symbols of the narrative. Um, and this is sort of a two-edged sword. You know, obviously, um, we have to reevaluate our values nowadays. You know, the world is in transit, like the talk implies. But it also makes a lot of people very insecure, as we see every day. So when we dismantle the old stories and the old myths, a lot of people get scared. And what they do is they just replace the old myths with new myths, like this guy. So uh, as you can see on the t-shirt, this guy believes in a flat earth. He's also holding it up. And this is literally what he thinks the world looks like. You know, it's kind of a pancake. And uh, judging by what we saw earlier with the world maps, uh, I'll leave it up to you to guess where this guy is from. Um, and one hint, it's not New Zealand. So this guy has a really cool time being a flat earther. Uh, there is a Netflix documentary called Beyond the Curve. And this guy, you know, he's telling his story and he's doing it in a way that, again, is very, very close to how we designers work. So he looks at data. He did some very thorough, I'm sure, um, research online. No, he didn't. Um, and then he gleaned some information from that. Um, he connected the dots, you know, um, like we all do to induce some knowledge. He had the big insight, you know, that the world is flat, obviously. Um, and he promoted that idea. It turned into wisdom within his community. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm being cynical right here. But again, this is so close to how we work as designers, right? But the guy didn't stop there. He went a little too far. Um, Ta-da, unicorn. So how far can you go with this tool? Um, you know, how far can you go with UX? There is such a thing as dark UX, you know? So we have methods and we can use them for whatever purpose. And dark UX is one example of how we can use our patterns, not necessarily for good, but to make people do stuff that they don't want to do. And the same is true for the dark side of storytelling. So how far can you go? Um, I leave it up to you, but beware of dark storytelling. It is happening. All right. So that was my talk. Those are my four points. Let's just uh, 
take a look at them in summary. So stories are really important because they define society. We share a narrative in our society that just makes the world go round for us, regardless of which shape that world has, of course. Um, we as designers um, can take the power of storytelling to make sense of the world, to make sense of complex products and make whatever we create much, much more relatable. And we can do that uh, with a process that seems very similar to the one we already know. Um, you can hack your design skills to try this more often. And just one suggestion from me to you um, for next time, you might be in a situation like I was when you get a briefing that seems disconnected. Just try to connect the dots with a story. Tell that story as you present. And uh, I'm confident that that's going to make your designs much better. And um, that's a little tip for me to you. And lastly, the dark side, um, storytelling is very powerful and um, beware of the dark side. All right, folks, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Would you guys, those who have the cameras on, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> Yay. Um, you can even unmute yourself and clap if in real life. Like, cool. Uh, thank you so much, Wolfgang. Um, super, super interesting. I, I, I didn't even expect it to go in these ways. And when you were presenting the maps, I was like, it's cool, but what are you trying to say with this? Until you got to the point as well of the flat earth, where I actually thought the guy had a very strong narrative, <laughs> regardless of uh, uh, how dark, let's say, the communication uh, side of us. So thank you so much for this. I think uh, you, you got us quite inspired. What I would like to do is I would like to open the floor for some questions. I imagine that you guys may have some. So um, I would simply encourage you to unmute yourself and ask the question directly. Who wants to go first? Okay, I, I have a question. <laughs> um, do you have any example of a difficult situation uh, creating a story for any of, yeah, any project? Uh, so examples for when we were struggling to define a story for a project? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the one that I shared about the tree and the wormhole and so on, that was probably the toughest one, uh, the toughest nut uh, we ever had to crack. So it was the, the real story goes a little bit differently, um, but I think it's what I told you is equivalent to that. And, um, you know, there was a very strong vision um, on the client side on one hand, and we kind of knew they were right, but we just didn't speak the same language. You know, we didn't really know how to how to sort of untie the knot. And the project had already been going on for, I think, five months or so. Uh, there was development involved. And then at some point, we had just hit you know, that stump where uh, nobody knew what we were really building. And um, the dots stayed unconnected. And then you know, we really had to stay, take a step back, pause everything. And then we really just um, drew pictures of a fantastic wonderland with trees for like you know, a month. So um, we were locking ourselves in a room with the client and then just laying out all of the different stories, interpreting the briefing in as many ways as we could, and uh, then come up with that sort of Bible, you know, and then we were writing the biographies of some of the artificial intelligences. We were also making a world map of how it's all connected with those wormholes. Um, there was also a magic system involved, you know, like the ones I showed you uh, where we say, okay, the assistant can do this, but not more. And maybe in, in that context um, about magic systems, there are soft magic systems and hard magic systems. And um, a soft magic system example would be, you know, Gandalf uh, in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, Gandalf shows up and he saves the day and we don't know how he did it. Now, when you manage your assets in a fantastical wonderland, that's very bad, you know? So one day uh, you're looking at your life tree and it's fine. And the next day, you know, Gandalf came and I don't know, the tree's dead. So that's not really cool. So we had to go for a so-called hard magic system uh, like they do in The Witcher, for example, which was translated into a game. So it has to be, even if it's magical and fantastical and it's a crazy story, um, it has to be calculable for the user. Otherwise, you know, 
you're destroying their, their life insurance. Thank you. Do you have any other questions in the room? I have a question, but I don't know if I'm being heard. Yep. Yes. All right. Great talk. Thank you very much. It's uh, very inspiring. I work actually in insurance. Um, originally, I'm <laughs> originally, I'm a mechanical engineer, but it was still inspiring, uh, even in my field. Um, my question has nothing to do with insurance, so nothing boring here. Um, I was wondering, I'm not a big book reader, but from the few experiences I had, and talking also to other people, reading books that was also interpreted as movies, in general, gives a, a bit of a disappointment or a less thrilling experience to people mm -hmm. uh, than the, the book itself. Um, I can think about, you know, the, uh, all the uh, thrillers of um, um, Da Vinci Code, uh, Inferno, uh, some other uh, thrillers, etc. So from your perspective on all the storytelling, how could, could we explain that, knowing that, you know, making a movie offers us a lot more tools than a book itself, which is basically ink on paper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, so you mentioned the Da Vinci Code, and by the way, um, the Da Vinci Code was written um, using the more methodical approach to writing. So, you know, he handles a lot of data. Um, he is, you know, building these really intricate narratives. And um, it's also cool that he mentioned it because I think he's always bordering on conspiracy theory, right? Um, like, and that's also a, an experience I made in my book. So it's a fantasy book, um, you know, about certain parts of myth methodology. So you look at the obscure sources like folklore, pretty much like J.K. Rowling did, and then you sort of tie a web of how that's all connected. And um, in my case, you know, I'm hoping to entertain and maybe educate kids, um, but not make people like uh, paranoid of where, I don't know, the body of Christ is hidden or something. Um, so I think when you start working in stories, um, you do that because you want to create certain emotions. And you're sort of wielding the tool um, of emotions in order to, you know, make your designs better, uh, make your story better, um, make the world better. So the thing is, once you start messing with people's emotions, you should take that very seriously. And um, because if you sort of invert the expectations and, you know, you change the character that somebody loved um, in the movie, you get a lot of frustration. I think the most recent example for that is uh, Artemis Fowl. I'm not sure if you know that. It's, um, I think, the second or third biggest kids book uh, globally after Harry Potter. So it's a very unique character. Um, and the movie makers thought, OK, um, the character is wrong. You know, I mean, a lot of people bought this book, but they're wrong. We have to change the character. And people hated it. So I think um, once you start dealing or messing with people's emotions, you have to respect that very, very much, you know, and um, not break any promises. I think that's okay. where a lot of the frustration stems from. OK, so without any spoiling, for those who didn't watch it, maybe that's also what happened a bit in Game of Thrones last season. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, George R. Uh, Martin writes in an intuitive, non-methodological way. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks, Leila. Cool. We have time for another question, in case. Uh -huh. I uh, apologize, Stephanie, if you want to go first. Um, no, go ahead, go ahead. We, we, can, we can take two. We can take two. So it my, it's, it's quite an obvious question there, uh, Wolfgang. So first, of, first thing first, thank you. It was a very, very nice, knowledgeable entertainment, entertaining, sorry. Um, I, this piece you've been working on with your team uh, on this VR experience, uh, you, you made it sound like it's something really cool. Where can we experience that? Uh, it's still being developed. It's still being oh, developed. Too so, bad. <laughs> um, I'm not sure of the current roadmap, um, but I guess it's another year out or so. And it's also um, a, a venture, so let's see what happens. But um, I think if we don't get it to market, uh, somebody else will. Because, like I said, you know, 
the world is so complex and I, for one, I hate having to deal with, you know, insurance, um, retirement, money, you know, and right now there is a big boom in the financial sector that tries to take the edge off of uh, all of the boring numbers. And I think the best vehicle to make these experience less frustrating is a uh, gamification in the widest sense, you know, so gamification is a big word. Um, they use a lot of the dark UX patterns that I sort of hinted at to make you addicted, you know, to put you in the dopamine cycle and make you spend more time. But um, I think gamification in terms of having this, you know, beautiful magic system that has a story, I think we're, we're only at the beginning of that. And um, I'm 100% sure it's going to happen. And, and if I could just add a little thing on that. Uh, so mm -hmm. the part of the briefing was to create that uh, as a virtual reality piece, or it was something that came from the side as a solution as well. It was really direct. It's like, we want something that is in VR experience. So we kind of uh, introduced the VR as a, as a key term in there ourselves, um, because, you know, the world was just so rich and so immersive um, that we knew, even if it happens on a phone, uh, we have to think of this in space, you know, so we have to think of a landscape of the spatial orientation of things in relationship to each other, like is the wormhole behind the tree, above the tree, below the tree, inside the tree, you know, and then configure all of that so that it supports the narrative as much as we could. So um, the spatial component was super important. Uh, so we decided to treat it, you know, like a virtual reality experience and all of the stories that we sketched um, even though we knew it was going to be mobile, were just you know big um, widescreen drawings. Yeah. So we, because of the complexity, because of the spatiality and the richness, um, we decided to treat it as VR, and I hope it's going to be you know scaled into VR. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Fingers crossed. <laughs> there was another uh, question, Ste Stephanie. Was it you? Yeah, yeah, it was me. Um, I wanted to ask, um, yeah, because you say that um, it's really, we have to be really careful when we mess with people's emotions. And I think that's kind of obvious, especially right now where we see a new rise in conspiracy theories and we really can experience how even educated people totally fall for it and stories and emotions totally override logic. Um, so I want to ask you if you have kind of a, framework in place to decide if what you are doing is ethical or if you like kind of rely on gut feeling for that yeah good point um really good point so like i said um people get tattoos of these magic systems you know so um that's really really powerful people also dress up as fantasy characters in their real life you know which is also incredible so i think if you're kind of delivering a good story, people are going to like it one way or another, and they're going to introduce it into their life. What I think is really important um, is that we separate the different parts of our lives, in a, if you know what I mean. So I think there are different layers of truth, you know. So the fact that the stars are up there and they're configured in a certain way, that's a fact. Um, and the fact that it kind of looks like a throne of that Ethiopian goddess, you know, that's maybe also a fact and it's a fact that people believe in it and that they live by it and that they tell stories so on top of the factual truth there is a sort of poetic truth you know and then i think it gets really really difficult if the two are um being merged with each other so you know i also have certain beliefs you know i'm not 100 percent secular um but i know where one ends and where the other you know begins and Maybe one story, you know, that I can tell you is um, about the Creation Museum in the United States. So my wife visited that like two, three years ago, and it's an attempt by, you know, a religious minority in the United States to say that the Bible was true about evolution. And it's hilarious, you know, they're really good at storytelling, but what they're trying to do is connect the poetic truth with the factual truth. You know, so they're pretending that um, the beautiful poetry of the Bible is a representation of life as it actually is. And it just isn't, you know. So I think um, a lot of the frustrations that we see nowadays in politics and, and you know, the way that the people look at the world is because we have lost the sense of what poetry is, you know. And 
I like poetry, you know, I write poetry, and um, it's just another facet of reality that has nothing to do with politics, you know, but um, unfortunately, in a 100% demystified world, uh, we forgot that, you know, so I think our poetic intelligence has sort of decreased. And I think um, the best way to answer your question, the best way to make people aware of what the difference is between poetry and reality is just to, you know, support the arts more, you know, educate the arts make people be artistic so that they can tell which is which. Yeah. Does it answer your question? <laughs> Actually, my question, like, I wasn't even supposed to be so broad, like, um, <laughs> really interesting answer. But what I was trying to get at was like, when you design, and then you use storytelling in your design, like, Mm -hmm. If you have like a kind of process or framework that you use to decide if what you're doing is ethical or if you're manipulating mm -hmm. people in a bad and dark way. Yeah, so I guess short answer, no. Um, but the cool thing about, you know, writing my own book right now is that um, I can pick what the mission of the book is. And I'm hitting like I'm hiding that mission, you know, under layers and layers of story. So that's really cool. I think if you are a designer, uh, the questions of like, ethics is the same in storytelling as in, you know, advertisement as in branding or as in UX. I guess it just depends on what you apply, apply your tools to, because um, design as a process is, you know, uh, agnostic. You know what I mean? But one uh, thing that I didn't mention about, you know, how far you should go with stories is uh, keep them implicit. Like if you have um, a really nice story, like we had, you know, with our tree, um, do it Hemingway style and keep 90% of the story hidden because people don't really care about the story. You know, they care about the function of what you're delivering, but um, you need to know what the story is because otherwise you're going to send mixed metaphors. Mm -hmm. So that's another, you know, limit that uh, I can mention. Okay. So we are time's up. We're out of time. So I would say huge thanks to Wolfgang for being here with us today. Huge thanks to all of you guys who tuned in, who put your cameras on. We love seeing your lovely faces again. Um, if anyone wants to connect with Wolfgang, we uh, added in the chat uh, his LinkedIn contact. So don't hesitate to reach out to him in case you have some other questions that maybe weren't answered this time. Um, I just want to say really quick that next month's topic uh, is going to be radical so super super interesting and i'm actually super happy to see alberto and lorenzo here today with us because they will be the speakers next month so stay tuned as we will send out the save the date as we send out the the uh, descriptions of the event we would be happy to see you there and apart from this I would wrap it up. I would say thank you so much, guys, for being here, for making this interactive, for, for making the most out of the virtual session. And I'm going to wish you a very lovely Friday and a happy weekend. Take care and stay safe wherever you are, guys. Thank you, folks. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Thank you.